welcome to the pudding. The sweet proof of research to back up what you already know about summer camp. My name is Travis Allison. My pronouns are he, him. And my name is Dr. Mandy Baker, and my pronouns are she, her. We are jumping into the world of research ethics today. I was having to think about it this week and um, seeing a little bit of researchy news pop up here, there, and everywhere. And I thought, you know what? This is one of those really foundational researchy things that people um, might benefit from knowing. So the plan is to talk a bit about research ethics, what that is, what that represents, what that means for research, and what that means for industry academic integrity, and a little bit about intellectual property. Where do you That's want to great. start? Well, I was thinking, Mindy, um, speaking of ethics and stuff, is there are there overarching policies about the ethics of research involving summer camp? I think that most of us know that there is some form of consent to be a part of a research project, but that's probably for those of us listening, that's what we know. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so in countries like Canada and Australia, where I was a researcher for many years, um, there is a national government uh, issued and regulated and maintained policy about doing research. Um, and this can look a few different ways. Here in Canada, it's called the Ethical Conduct for Research Involving Humans. So there's lots of different kinds of research. There's research that's medical in nature or that works with um, uh, samples that come from bodies. So what we might call bio, bi biological bio samples. Mm. Um, that's not this kind of research. When we yeah. talk about doing research with humans or involving humans, we're talking about inter intra relational kinds of research so finding out stuff that they will tell us and share with us um, and what they'll share with us in various ways so this includes quantitative the qualitative the whole spectrum um, and that includes things like numbers but uh, and interviews as well as like pictures and videos and some other creative art forms um, and in Canada there's three major entities within the national government that address and, and facilitate research um, I'm gonna, I'm pulling up the policy as we speak. Um, and they're called the Tri-Council here in Canada. And the Tri-Council involves uh, the three different bits. So there's the Canadian Institute of Health Research, Natural Sciences and Engineering. There's the Research Council of Canada and Social Sciences and Humanity Research. That's us. And the short form is called SHRC. Um, yep. That's what the acronym is. And then mm -hmm. there is also um, the Council for Medical Research. So what do they call themselves? Uh, Canadian Institute of Health Research. Mm -hmm. So yep. Tri-Council makes up those three things. Um, and they have gotten together and um, issued this overarching policy about doing research with humans. Um, it was issued in 2018. It's always, when you're looking for this thing, it's always worth looking for updates. I know the Australian one was issued in 2017, but had an update in 2020, 21. Mm -hmm. um, these are these overarching policies that apply for doing research. But let me put a little caveat. Yeah tends to be academic research. Yeah. So in a previous episode, we talked about lots of different kinds of research. Academic, imperial, uh, empirical, pardon me, or pure research, um, this is what this governs. If you were doing a piece of market research at your camp, you, you are not uh, required to go through an extensive research ethics process. We would hope anybody who's doing market research, which is finding out who your audience is and what they want, need, and, and how they experience your product or service, um, we would hope you were being careful, thoughtful about being ethical with the participants, yep. um, but it doesn't require the same level of process. So in terms of process from the academic end, let me tell you what our end looks like. Your, and then I'll tell you what your end looks like, actually, because sure. yeah. it helps to know what your rights are as a participant in research. So if you're sent a survey from an industry organization, a camp, a governing body, you have rights as a participant. And those rights should actually be spelt out to you very, very clearly at the beginning. This is what we do when we get consent forms. They're actually called informed consent. Yeah. We must inform you. Um, there, the ability to do blind or blinded research, that, that idea of not telling the participant what they're up for or what they're going to be observed for, that's very, very rarely done. And that's because it rarely gets past ethics boards. There's something that's seen as very unethical about not telling people what they're consenting to. Yeah. Um, so 
so knowing that you have rights as a participant, it's important. Actually, let's start there. Here's what you should know. You should know what the research is about. You should know what it's going to take for you to participate. You should know what you're going to get back from it. And you should know that you have the right to withdraw your consent at any given time, before, during, after. And after can be years after. If you've decided for whatever reason you don't want your data involved in that particular study, you can yep. rescind it. You can withdraw it. So those are the things you should know up front, and they should stick true to that. You were talking about getting things approved. So you have a, yeah. a board that you have to go before and, and yeah. justify the research and justify all of those different things that you've looked after all of those things. Yeah. Um, and I mean, I think that when we, people who don't, don't do a lot of research all the time, think about research, there are definitely things that people come up with. I mean, I, I have a degree in psychology. So for me, it's Milgram's experiments. It's the Stanford prison experiment, all yeah. of those things that are the basis of modern, well, not the basis, you have a good point about what the basis of modern ethics of research is, but yeah. that's some of the stuff that sticks out to us. That stuff's As not it should allowed, do, by the way. You can't. <laughs> No, no one can get even close to those because the you have to have all those things. And uh, some of that research was even approved eth ethically, but then the research was done not based on what was approved. And yeah. so, but th that's just stuff. It's Im not impossible. It is incredibly hard for that research to get anywhere in the world today because of bad things that have happened in the past. Yeah. And, and let's keep in mind uh, sort of the, the context of we're talking about Western industrialized countries, largely mm -hmm. countries that have a Eurocentric um, history to them, if not being European countries themselves. Um, but the the sort of major turn point or watershed moment in research ethics comes from uh, the post German Nazi moment, uh, the Nuremberg trials, and particularly the trials that looked at the kind of experimentation that was done on people who were held in concentration camps. I mean, we were chatting about it before, absolutely traumatic, barbaric kinds of things were done to people who were incarcerated in these concentration camps. Um, and as the Nuremberg trials sort of unpacked some of the things that happened there, there, the United Nations developed a particular set of values about how research should be conducted going forward. And in, in all um, cases, the, the concern is about causing no harm. Um, but being more than that, it's that it actually, the research actually is beneficial, it's constructive, it's adding something to the world. Um, to repeat a study just for the heck of it um, is not enough. It needs to show how it's going to continue to advance knowledge and be beneficial back to that population. Um, and I mean, this shows up in lots of different language and iterations in these kinds of national policies that talk about, for example, the Canadian one talks about respect for persons, concern for welfare and justice. And these values bring us back to that idea of do no harm, but also do benefit, you know, offer benefit or something meaningful uh, contribution out of the research. So, it, yeah, I, mean, can I, it just, I think most of those make sense. Offer a benefit to you as the research participant. Can you just give us what that means? Because sometimes that means you're getting a gift card of some kind, yeah. but other times it doesn't. Yeah. Uh, look, uh, from a research ethics point of view, it's a pretty big picture view, macro view of what it means to offer benefit. So that benefit may not come directly back to the participant in a very concrete or tangible form, right, yeah. but it still needs to filter its way back even in an abstract form. So here's an example of how it might work at camp. Um, we want to do a piece of research to understand um, the mood uh, levels of people as they transition back from camp back into their normal everyday lives. The benefit that we're hoping that we're going to find out is to understand the what I'll call the seasonality, the seasons of mood that happen through the fall and winter as people come out of camp and potentially gear up to go back into camp employment. Um, that's one thing that if we can speak to the entire industry about these mood state seasons yeah. that potentially yeah. providers and employers can anticipate and start planning um, interventions or preventions of particularly low mood states through that that you know, return season. Um, and we'd even like to go further. This is a study that we're we're working on and trying to drum up some granting money for at the moment. We'd like to go further. We'd also like to be able to ask participants about the kinds of things that they, the strategies they enact and they mobilize that actually helps 
them boy in transition from one culture can't into their everyday life culture um, because if we can we can kind of capture it or distill it well, then we can offer a toolbox a, a tool case of strategies back to employees to yeah. industry to deliver so what you can hear there is the the benefit may or may not get directly to that participant. I mean, with we always have the intention of sharing our research directly to participants, but by the time we have results, often it's a fairly scattered crowd. It's hard sure. to kind of pull them back together. But yeah. our hope is that we're benefiting them by making sure that the entire industry has access to that knowledge and those tools. So that's right. what it means by providing benefit. Um, and and often research will be put in front of a board that actually either has isn't articulated or um, doesn't provide any kind of significant benefit, or they haven't thought through how to translate the results into benefit. Um, and when this kind of thing happens, just, just to be clear, when you put in a research application, it goes to a board. The board is made up of all kinds of people, senior uh, academics and researchers within the university and a collection of lay people that represent lots of different facets and corners of the community. So it can be, we usually have some kind of legal expert. We usually have a doctor and or a psychologist. We often will invite um, clergy from whichever uh, religious affiliations are most dominant in that, in that community. Um, and so you're getting lots of different eyes, lots of different perspectives looking at the application. Um, if an application is just sort of has no substance or highly threatening, usually that's when you see something kind of get kicked back and it's a big fat, bum, bum, nope, you didn't get the points, try again, or don't, please don't try that one again. <laughs> so let's get a bit of those ones. Most of the time our applications go in and we get sent back of like, what did you mean by this? And how about that? And what are you going to do about this problem? And we saw a problem here that you may not have seen yet. How would you address it? So it's not so much like an acceptance rejection kind of process. It's like an iterative process of our eyes see more than yours do. How will you deal with all these other things? And most of the time, you know, as a researcher, I'm sitting there going, oh, yeah, of course, I already thought about that. I just forgot to write it down. So we work through it in terms of like um, getting rid of risky things or mitigating or managing. So, for example, um, there is a risk when I do research asking people about their mood states that I'm yeah. going to find out something that's I might trigger something that's upsetting for someone. I might find out things that are, you know, disclosure that there's a disclosure of potential harm and I need to go through proper reporting process processes. Lots of camp people will know what I'm talking about when I talk about that. And so when that happens, it's always helpful to have already thought through your strategy before it does. So then I've got it planned. You know, I've got yep. the phone numbers on hand. I've got the referrals. I know who I need to make the next phone call to. Um, and I can walk through that plan. Um, and that's what that's what those ethics boards, ethics reviews stuff is about. If you're ever invited to be part of research, they must tell you their research ethics clearance number in that informed consent and provide you the information, the contact information to reach the research department of that institution if you have any questions or complaints. So that is another marker of knowing that the research has gone through this very rigorous process of making sure that it won't have any harm, that if you see an R number or an H Rex, so H R E C number, yeah. they're signifying to you that they did all the hurdles, they've done all the thinking, that there's been more than a couple of eyes looked at the project and said, we can feel confident that there will be no or very little harm and the little harm that might be part of it. We've thought it through, we have strategies for it. What well, you talked about uh, Canada and Australia. Mm -hmm. Is there the same thing in the States? Look, I'm not the expert of what's going on in the States, sure. and I Fair. definitely need to do a little bit more homework on it. Um, an initial and we need to get Lori on. on. Yeah, we do. And we will. And we yeah. will. Lori, we're coming for you if you're listening. Um, um, the, the best I can understand from some very preliminary look at this is that there are research policies, but they're different per um, research institution and depending on who's governing the research or the research institution. Okay. And that's probably not that far off how we understand governance in the United States can happen, that actually some things sit at a state level that in Canada, we'd be like, hey, that's national level. Sure. So it means that it's a bit more piecework. It's a bit more of a puzzle and you need to kind of pick your way through those puzzles. So they definitely still exist, but whether or not the it has the same sort of national regulatory kind of system involved, doesn't look like it works quite the same way. Okay, cool. 
So if we move on to some of the other parts of this, what um, one of the things you, you put in the notes was academic integrity. What sure. sort of stuff is important for us to think about when we're considering camp yeah. research and academic integrity? Yeah, for sure. Um, so uh, academic integrity or research integrity, they're slightly different things. If you've ever done research at a university, you'll have to take at least one or two workshops for training, whether that's online or otherwise you get trained on all this kind of stuff. But it's also talking about uh, the value base and the expectations or standards of how you will conduct yourself and your mm. behavior as a researcher or as a research center or institute. So universities often house research centers or institutes. So they're like, smaller clusters or collections of people and experts within the uh, within the the university um and regardless though that the university will hold you to a particular standard of behavior so these things come down to an academic integrity and anybody who is a student in post-secondary education would be aware of it's understanding sort of what is plagiarism what is you know being honest about the work that is yours and that is yours originally or a sole author versus um, giving credit to work that you are either borrowing from or building on um, so often when people paraphrase like they they hear an idea they learn an idea and then they paraphrase that information back out to the world. When yeah. we do it, when we're chatting, we don't really recognize that we're even doing it. We weave previous knowledge in with our current knowledge and we kind of spin and, and carry on. Um, so it's a little bit har harder in the spoken tradition. In the written tradition, we would normally put some kind of citation or a footnote, some kind of signi signifying marker that says, hey, look over here, this is where the original author was, or this is the author where I got this idea from. Um, it helps us trace things like the family tree of ideas, but it's also kind of a declaration of honesty, like, hey, I'm not the original source of everything, or I shouldn't be given credit for this. Um, what I take credit for is the innovation I built off the shoulders of giants, if that mm -hmm. makes sense. And that's kind yeah. of that practice of plagiarism. There's other ways of, unfortunately, there's lots of different ways of cheating or taking other people's material or taking credit for it. In universities, we often see collusion. People um, a student borrows somebody else's paper and then kind of half copies it. That's a collusion. Um, okay. Or when students write papers together. Yeah. Um, and I remember before we had text matching and AI that worked for us in terms of finding these kinds of matches. Yeah. I remember working on a course, we had 500 students on the one campus. It was 1,000 students, two different campuses. I was in charge of one campus. And I was marking like hundreds of papers and I still could find it because people's um, voice in their writing is just like a fingerprint. It's very, very unique. And so when somebody else's like accent and slang shows up in some in another paper, you're like, hang yeah. on a second, I'm sure I've heard this voice today. And I could flip through, you know, 50 papers later and go, yeah. hey, these two match. Um, and, you know, often uh, the thing that we know about cheating in academia, and of course we've done a ton of research on it because we're nerds and we do research on everything. Yeah. Um, most people who cheat are not, dumb yeah. or mean right. um they are desperate is what we find out and yeah. desperate comes in a couple of different ways they ran out of time mm. poor time management yes but being overwhelmed with a lot of coursework or trying to work while you're trying to do a lot of coursework yeah. that's hard yeah. um right. the other is they truly don't comprehend what's going on and they get scared to ask for help and then they get right. desperate about performing. Yeah. Um, and that's when we see people colluding, but also that's where AI and ghostwriting um, starts to show up. So ghostwriting is when somebody else writes your paper and you uh, take credit as the full author. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, put your name on it. Um, and that's a little different than using AI or those kinds of tools because um, using AI requires you to drive the boat still or drive the car or whatever. You, you're still yeah. driving that vehicle. So yeah. you really have to tell AI what's in your head and what you want it to do. And then you very much have to steer and shape it because it, mm. it'll spit out weird nonsense back to you and you've got to know how to edit. And to be able to edit a, a piece of AI, you have to know the content you're trying to deliver. Yeah. So yeah. ultimately you can still see the authorship, the idea idea driver is still there whereas yeah. uh, ghostwriting is like truly either paid or unpaid asking somebody else to write it and slapping your name on the front yeah so these are these are all what we call academic integrity all of them are problems all of them are problems because 
Look, in the academic world, you haven't really earned your mark or your qualification. Um, and at the end of the day, you know what that means? Okay, you got the qualification, but can you actually perform what that qualification promises you can do? Chances yeah. are you can't if you've borrowed a lot. Yeah. If that makes sense. If you if you keep using other people's work, um, yeah. chances are you can't perform what that qualification promises. In the um, professional world, this is when you're actually taking somebody's payroll. Yeah. So when you put your name on somebody else's work, whether you just heard it at a conference or yeah. you heard it on the radio or you heard it or you read it somewhere, or you saw it in a newspaper article, um, if you're using it to actually fulfill your job and that's where your payrolls come from, you're taking the money that probably should have gone to the person that you took the ideas off from. So that's that's where we shift now the conversation into intellectual property is, you know, um, academic integrity is about recognizing in a, in this within this world where credit is due and getting in that habit of um, acknowledging it um, in the industry world. It's still OK to use other people's idea. They are due the credit. What you need to recognize is your distinction is what you built or innovated in and above and original on top of what was there before. Yeah. Um, and that's where intellectual property law starts showing up is like needing to protect your good ideas. You don't always necessarily need to protect the exact words, um, but being able to protect good ideas and and having those ideas be protected. So if you're taking somebody's other ideas or work, um, it needs to be recognized. Now I'm jumping backwards just to mm. also talk about research integrity. So this is another layer on top of academic integrity. This is also about being very honest and upfront uh, about uh, data, how it was collected, uh, how it was analyzed and what it produced. Um, and we know there's major cases throughout history about data fabrication, so making up results um, or fraudulent data or manipulated, like manipulating data to get it to say something you want it to say because it's, you know, going to put you in a position, often it's within academia, it's often desperate again, that will get you more research funding or the opportunity to do the next layer of the study. Yeah. So these are value based things and we know that there is nobody looking over my shoulder double checking we're getting much better about it in research we do a lot more data sharing we keep what we keep open data sources so that people can look at our data. Um, but it's also a, a good reminder of being staying curious and staying critical. When you're right. when you're reading data or when you're engaging with your own data, so say you did a market survey and you pulled all these scaled responses, you could cut the data like you can pick out a piece of data that's going to say what you want it to say. Right. Um, and you need to be very, very careful um, that you don't do that just to appease a market. And this is actually something that's shown up a lot in camp research. There's a lot of camp research that says like all these good things happened at camp. But then when you get down into their number crunching, um, it's what we call not statistically significant. So it's helpful for the reader or the, the consumer of this data who operates an industry to understand the difference between this is interesting, descriptive data, yeah. but statistically it doesn't actually hold up to very much. So don't right. don't bet the bank on it. I guess let's let's say there was a piece of research that says candle making at camp will fix depression in youth. Okay? Yeah. That's yeah. that's so cool. Yeah. Let's go make let's more, make more candles, candles, right? Yeah. Like let's just totally make candles. But when you read the statistical bit and it says not st statistically significant, that's when you go, okay, let's spend a hundred dollars on candle making, not a thousand. Mm. <laughs> like that's when you like you just go, okay. Make decisions and, based on, yeah. Right. And it would be very um, tempting if you were running your own camp survey to pull out the stuff that only speaks well about your camp or to yeah. pull out the bit of the population that only speaks well of your camp and to leave the rest on the cutting room floor. Yeah. In academia, that's a not okay. Right. We need to be very upfront about this is what we found out. This is who it works for. This is who it doesn't work for. Here's the odds and sods box of the stuff we can't make sense out of yet, but we kind of hope we can. Yeah. Um, and that's, I think that's really, really important. Great. Great. I appreciate that. Uh, I know that intellectual property is an important part of this. Who owns the data? Who gets responsibility for it? And and that that's obviously wrapped up in plagiarism, of course, but are there other parts of that? 
Yeah, look, it, it sort of flags. I mean, I don't know if it's straight up and down IP, um, but maybe something along the lines of research integrity. It flags an experience I've had a few different times um, mm -hmm. between uh, myself as I'm trying to do research and then share that story out in the world and then the marketing half of the institution. Sure. Um, so uh, when I worked at my last university, I did some cool stuff. I was pretty excited about it. I wanted to share it with the world. And and we had this phenomenal comms team, like honestly, brilliant people who knew how to tell a great story that makes sense for non-nerds or yeah. slightly nerds, not people quite as intense <laughs> as myself. And they would take, you know, kind of the, the brief, the notes, the material I'd hand them, and they'd weave a story that made more sense for a blog or a social post or that kind of, or even some of the webinar work that we were doing. It, I have so much respect for their ability to storytell. It is yeah. so cool. Um, and it's something that's not automatic for me. It's something I have to work very hard for. But at the same time, what is um, compelling, uh, engaging, potentially even sensational for the audience sure. yeah. can actually shift the narrative that's true to the data. And so right. we would rub, there would be a lot yeah. of like friction at that point where I'd be like you can't say that and then they would say but nobody cares about the details you know because to <laughs> me the context where it was everything you yeah, know yeah. this is yeah. effective candle making is effective for the you know seven year olds and three quarters on yeah. July the third you know yeah. that that's what the data tells me that's what I can be confident about and they would write a story that says candle making is great for all children all year long right because that makes a better story yeah. um so I think, I don't know if it's uniquely intellectual property, but it's also understanding the source and the audience. We're often right. driven by the audience. You tell us this all the time, listen to your audience, speak to your audience, think about your audience. This is user design research. Um, but also when it comes to when, either when you're engaging in the research and you're trying to share it back out to the world, or you're you are the world consuming that research, it's yeah. a good reminder to say curious and critical and that doesn't mean destructive but critical like where did this information come from what is the source um who what is the the format the mode that the information is being delivered and this was something you mentioned earlier we talked about conflict of interest and we were yeah. talking about where does funding come from right so good research will declare where funding comes from and that is a requirement of our ethics review process. We need to say the money comes from these guys or the, this institution, and that allows a whole set of eyes to look at it and say, is this research actually being driven or shaped by the funding source? Yeah. And the truth is, actually, it happens. Um, what we hope when we operationalize good research is that the funding people say, this is what we are want to do. This is what yeah. we want to find out. This is what we're aiming for. This is what we want to do with it. And the researcher goes, thank you. I'm going to put all of these into the parameters. I'm going to give you a heads up. We may not find out what you're hoping to find out. That's not how data works. I will provide you with everything as a response. I will, uh, when I'm setting up contracts, I will say, I will publish on what I find, not yeah. on what necessarily you like. Yeah. But in terms of how you get the story out, you can choose how to tell the story. Okay. But from an academic publications point of view, I'm going to tell the story of what's in the data. So mm. I don't mm. know. I, I don't know how I ended up on the academic side of TikTok, getting TikTok videos, but but there's That's a little cool. debate going on right now about okay. research and funding. And it started yeah. from somebody saying, um, people in the majority are used to explaining things by saying, I read this, I saw this here. Like they just start with with um citation, basically. Sure. And and this I guess it lends like, credibility. Okay. Right, sure. And this guy was saying yeah. that is such a, you know, that it's such a thing for white people that white people do a lot. And <laughs> then another professor yeah. is like, well, yeah, but we have to say that we do research. We have to say that there's a, we can't just say a thing. And the, the comeback that I thought was interesting was that looking, the research is, is changed by who pays for it. Mm -hmm. um that if uh that uh, corporations pay for a lot of research at universities a lot mm -hmm. of research that doesn't line up just like you said doesn't line up with their business interests gets shelved and doesn't get put yeah. out because it doesn't line up and yeah. so we have to acknowledge that that research isn't pure that there no. is there is a thing behind it there may be an angle there's definitely influences 
And I think a part of what you're saying is obviously we have to account for those things. We need to, the, the people that are funding, we have to give them our criteria, but we also have to be open about who is, um, you know, who's paying for this stuff. Yeah. Well, and I look, it depends on your tradition of philosophy. So this is, you know, getting a PhD is a doctorate of philosophy and sure, the philosophy yeah. helps you understand kind of the way you're going to deal with a lot of different stuff. Mm -hmm. And that's why I would expect anybody getting a PhD to have a decent philosophical knowledge. Like here's all the different things and I picked to stand here. Yeah. Um, so in some philosophies of research, we understand that knowledge is co-created. We create it together. Mm -hmm. It is um, a product of our context, our relationships, the, co the environment we're in, our culture. You know, so I'm a sociologist, so sociocultural person. So I, get, I, I talk about all of those influences. And I talk about them openly when I position myself in a, pa in a publication, in a research application, da 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 da, -da. Um, often the research that is most taught across high schools in Western industrialized places um, and is often assumed what makes good research is positivist, post-positivist, and they rarely declare their position. They there's It's sort of this like, I got here, I earned my stripes, so I am an expert. And that's, yeah. that's just the nature of the philosophy of the thing. But what it does in terms of the approach to dealing with conflict of interest is that I'm going to say up front, the institute that is funding this is very much part of shaping the boundaries, the parameters, the expectations, the purpose. And thank goodness those institutions fund us. Of course. Because yeah. there would be a lot of amazing work that wouldn't make the surface if yeah. we didn't have these guys on board. And by guys, I mean non-gender. These yeah. institutions who will fund these things. And the institutions are often funding things because they see a problem and they want the best solution for the people they serve. Right. Um, so I have a lot of, I think, you know, national research is meant to remove that con that conflict of interest. It's meant yep. to come through, um, you know, government funds. But I'll tell you right now, that's just as political and shapes yeah. the kind of work you do and the kind of, of proposals you offer. I remember when I was prepping a proposal, this is back in Australia, and our grant writer kept saying, we're about to have a change in government. You're going to have to rewrite this whole section. Because you need to appeal to this government's policy. The way they think their philosophy. And what they are trying to achieve with their right. three, four years. Yeah. Um, so I, I, th I think it's important to remember that all things are influenced in shapes. We can't yeah. extricate ourselves or research for that matter from our social culture environment. We live in this context. Yeah. Um, just not everybody is of the tradition to believe that that is something they should say and declare and be clear about. Um. At the same time, though, there are definitely steps in the academic research process that puts um, kind of like boxes we have to fill in and yeah. that get published. So yeah. even when we're publishing, for example, when I'm publishing an article, I will get asked in the manuscript stage, has this been funded by anybody? And mm. that should get printed in. Usually it's in the margin or in the footnote on the first page. Yeah. Um, and that allows the reader to ask themselves the question of, do I think this institution significantly biased the work? So biased is a little different. So bias says that they've shaped it to such an extent that the work is maybe not as honest, as generalizable, as credible as it could be. Um, I believe that the, the transparency helps alleviate that cautiousness or that, course, yeah. that cynicism. Yeah. Um, it doesn't. But at the same time, I also don't try to declare that I'm uninfluenced. No. I'm, I'm influenced. These are my influences. Does that make yeah, sense? Absolutely. Um, so that debate can that probably will rage on and on. And part of it is because there are people with just totally different systems of thinking um, to then acknowledging that co-creative process. Right. Mandy, I really appreciate you breaking all this down for us and helping us think about this in lots of different ways. Um, is there anything you'd like to finish off this chat with to, to bring it all together? Um, look, I, I think if I had a like go to, it's, uh, it's often very similar to the kind of values we brought forward, you know, being intentional about the kind of research you're doing, if you're yeah. running surveys or you're running some kind of, you know, pilot style research in your camps, um, understanding your position in that and reflecting on that 
offering transparency, you know, about the process, which also requires documenting your process to go yeah. through the decisions you're making and being kind of aware, self-aware of those kinds of things. Um, and if you're consuming knowledge, so that's on the producing knowledge side, if you're consuming knowledge, it's, I think my words are always curious and critical, you know, not yeah. cynical, not destructive, but that curiosity, like if that question popped into your head, scribble it down, write it to the author, ask it. Like, I, I yeah. don't see anything wrong with asking honest, curious questions. Um, and those curious questions will hopefully surface for you the ability to have enough information to make a decision for yourself. So not just because there's a great stamp on it or it got the most funding money, but because you ask questions that satisfy that idea of like, has this been unduly influenced? Or if it is influenced, what value do I have in transferring it out to my context or these people or those people. Yeah. Right. Ah. Thanks, Mandy. No worries. And if you didn't know, now you know, Kit Pros. <laughs> 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 <laughs>